Okay, good morning, everybody. Thank you all for joining us for day two of our Pollinator Week webinar series here, uh, hosted by Quail Forever in Arkansas. Um, today, we have biologists Kelly Bufkin and Wes Tucker. They will be talking to us about pollinator habitat planning and site prep. Um, just to let everybody know, we, uh, we are recording this webinar and it's also being uh, live streamed on our Facebook page at Quail Forever in Arkansas. Um, and this recording will also be posted on our, our YouTube channel uh, when we're done later today. So wanted to remind everybody that uh, please go ahead and make sure you're all muted on the way in. Uh, if you can, you know, turn your cameras off. Uh, as we're going through the webinar, if you have any questions that pop up, feel free to just type them into the chat box. Um, you can find that in the toolbar down at the bottom of your screen. And then uh, as we wrap up the webinar, uh, I'll jump back on and read through those questions that you all type in there uh, for Kelly and Wes to answer. Uh, same thing goes for those that are joining us on Facebook Live. You can type questions into the comment section there and we'll get those answered for you too. All right, with that, uh, Kelly and Wes, take it away. All right, well, thanks everyone for uh, kind of joining us and tuning in with us today. As Ryan said, my name is Kelly Bufkin. I'm the farm bill biologist working out of the USDA Service Center in Hot Springs. And my name is Wes Tucker and I'm the farm bill biologist working out of the Service Center in North Little Rock. And as you can see in the title today, we're going to be talking to you about pollinator habitat planning and site prep. And just a quick note, uh, if you missed yesterday's presentation on the birds and the bees, that one has been recorded and is available to rewatch on Facebook. And I would definitely recommend checking that out because we'll be building on that. And so um, to just kind of jump right into it, you know, let's start with kind of a, just a working definition of what we're talking about today. Uh, what is site prep? I, I pulled this off of the Tallgrass Prairie Center's website. You know, a site prep, it alters the existing vegetation and soil structure in advance of seeding, increasing emergence, growth, and survivorship of the seeded natives by removing thatch, improving seed to soil contact, and reducing weeds. So, uh, you know, what does that mean? We're, we're getting rid of what's there so we can plant what we want. And um, we want to ensure the best available establishment for these seed mixes. You know, we, uh, these can be quite expensive sometimes and you're spending a lot of money to um, you know, establish this. And we just want to make sure we have the best chances of survival possible and that comes from good quality site prep. Uh, we'll talk about examples as we go forward of uh, you know, things that can happen with bad site prep. And so again, we just, we want to, if we're doing it, we want to make sure we're doing it right. And uh, just a quick disclaimer here, uh, what we're going to be talking about, these site prep methods are not necessarily to be used everywhere. Uh, throughout the state of Arkansas, especially in the Ozarks and uh, throughout the Washita mountain regions, and even in Southwest Arkansas, some of our Blackland Prairie areas, we have you know, kind of what we call remnant sites. These are these are areas where the seed bank is still relatively intact, you know, with high quality forbs and native grasses. And you can't necessarily tell from this photo, but I took this in the Ozarks several weeks ago. And along the ground here, there are a lot of high quality prairie plants. There's goat's rue, there's rattlesnake master, there's different species of milkweeds, uh, native grasses like big blue stem, little blue stem, and a whole host of other good quality uh, remnant site type plants. So the methods that we're going to be talking about are specifically what we would use in, you know, like a pasture conversion. But that's usually the scenario that we're dealing with. There are other scenarios where we're converting land use types, but mostly we're converting pastures, introduced grasses. So on sites like this, you know, it, it's a matter of you know, getting rid of the cedars, getting rid of the, the hardwood re-sprouts in there, and that can be accomplished maybe just with fire, maybe with some, uh, you know, some very targeted herbicide use on the trees, but we don't want to disturb the ground too much here because what we would, you know, possibly just be planting is, is already here. So we, uh, this is an example of those remnant sites where we don't want to use a lot of the methods that we're going to be talking about. 
Another example, throughout southwest Arkansas, we have a chain of these very unique prairie systems called the Blackland Prairies. And uh, they're just like little dots all over the map throughout southwest Arkansas that kind of runs southwest starting in Arkadelphia. And many of our Blackland Prairies today sort of look like this. They're, they're cedar forests. And that's just came from a, from a lack of fire. Fire suppression the last several decades allowed these to grow up. But again, it's another example of we don't want to do a lot of soil disturbance here. We don't want to do anything that's going to damage the seed bank. So a site like this, it would be a matter of, uh, you know, slowly but surely getting rid of the cedars and reintroducing fire. And not to cut you off here, Kelly, but, you know, if you've got a site that, that you're not sure about, if you're on property, um, that, you know, it may be a remnant site and you just don't really know, that's what we're here for. So feel free to give any of your biologists in your area a call. Um, and we'd be glad to come out and take a look at your site um, and just give you whatever recommendations you need. So if, you, if you're not sure if you've got a remnant site or if you just kind of want to talk to us, um, feel free to holler at us and we'll be glad to look at that with you. Yep, absolutely. That's our job, come out and talk to good folks and look at the properties. It's uh, the best part of what we do. So again, taking care of sites like this, we can turn, you know, a remnant site from something like this back into an actual restored native prairie. You know, these pictures are taken on the boundary lines of this property. One is private property and one is a public land uh, restored Blackland Prairie. So we don't want to mess with the soil too much here because it, it, it's there. You know, we start burning these sites and we don't want to do a lot of damage to them. So I just wanted to get that out of the way. Um, remnant sites are precious and should be protected. And that's kind of one of the things we deal with sometimes. So going forward, you know, just a quick overview of, you know, what we said about site prep earlier. You know, we want to reduce the competition of the vegetation that we're trying to establish. We want to reduce competing vegetation that might hinder the uh, native seed mix that we'd be putting down. You know, we want good seed soil contact and that we lead at least 50% bare ground to do that. The closer we get to 100% is better, obviously. And also, we generally don't like to use fertilizer in these establishments. So for site prep, we're not using fertilizer, especially nitrogen, because that could just increase the amount of competing annual and perennial weeds that we might have to deal with later on. Now there's a caveat there, if you're dealing with a cost share program that may require something like that, we usually just sort of deal with that on a case by case basis. All right, so uh, get, getting into this, I'd like to start with uh, just a clean slate. You know, and what does that mean? When, when we're going into a site prep before planting, Again, this is all important to establish a good, a good seeding. So we want to burn off or somehow graze or hay the original introduced grass that's there in a pasture setting or a field setting. And we can use fire in the dormant season to do that. That way in the spring, we just have new growth. Or in the spring and early summer, we could graze or hay that to bring it down and just have new growth being established. And uh, you wouldn't really want to mow because bush hogging and mowing leaves, uh, leaves a lot of heavy thatch on the ground, which will actually hinder the, um, the herbicide from coming in contact with the grasses that we're actually trying to get rid of. So burning first, grazing or haying first, you know, and allow about six inches of growth for the new vegetation. This could take, you know, several weeks, it may take a month, but regardless, you want, you want enough vegetation back so you have uh, one to have enough contact with the herbicide so it does a good job of getting rid of it but also you want enough material at the uh, the end of the site prep to actually have enough fuel to carry a fire to leave you with a clean seed bed and uh, we would like to use an herbicide that's going to take care of both broad leaves and grasses there are broadly specific herbicides there are grass specific herbicides and then there's also, you know, non-selective herbicides like glyphosate, which we use a lot of. And so as many treatments as necessary, it's, uh, we like to get at least two. And we have uh, an examples that we'll talk about later in the presentation of why that's important. But uh, it may take the whole growing season sometimes, but just we use as many treatments as necessary following the recommended rates on the herbicide label. And again, we burn off the dead thatch at the end of the site prep process. <clears throat> so starting with a clean slate, what does that look like sometimes? 
you know, if we're using fire, we're just getting rid of the existing vegetation so we can have that brand new growth to come back before we start treating with, with herbicide. You know, we can, this is a good example of a, a field that had a lot of woody encroachment on it and they used a fire to just burn straight through this and all of those smaller saplings are dead now. They're, we don't have to worry about those next year when that field starts growing up again. And then haying, uh, a lot of our producers and participants we work with uh, either own haying equipment or have access to it or know someone that can come and hay their property beforehand. And then uh, grazing is also another great way to begin this clean slate. And, and again, you know, this isn't something that you would be doing like in your yard if you were doing like a small pollinator plot. There are other simpler ways to accomplish that, obviously. But on larger settings, when we're doing, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 acre uh, conversions, you know, this is it's more feasible to accomplish that. So I'm gonna let Wes take over from here. So yeah, um, in, in my area, you know, and Kelly's too, but you know, depending on where you're at, you're gonna have different scenarios that you're dealing with. And like we said earlier, that's kind of what we're here for is to, is to be that person to let you know like maybe what, what you're looking at when it, when it comes down to, you know, what do I have to do to get, get my site from whatever it is to being good habitat. Um, so in my area, you know, a lot of what we deal with is, you know, fescue uh, pastures, all fescue pastures. And um, as you can see here, this is just a monoculture of fescue. And, you know, whether it's, you know, a guy that maybe his grandpa had, had cows here uh, 10, 20 years ago. Um, but, you know, for him, he maybe doesn't have cows anymore. And in this field, it's just laying waste and um, maybe gets, it's bush hogged a couple of times a year or somebody cuts it for hay, but he's not really doing anything with it. So. Um, kind of what we what we're trying to you know get this whole week is um, just because that's what it is right now doesn't mean that's what it has to be and so we want to try to help you figure out how, how do you get from a site like this that's so common that we see today in Arkansas to something more like this and you know whatever you might want to call it whether it's um, you know pollinator habitat quail habitat uh, whether you're a big deer hunter and couldn't care less about quail um, you know, whatever it is, we, we like to joke that, you know, we're, it's not just quail that we deal with. Um, as you can see, we're doing this pollinator week here um, because, you know, what's good, for, what's good for pollinators is good for quail. So, um, you know, whatever it is that you might be interested in, it's probably the best route to go is with native habitat, and we want to help you do that. So, you know, how do we start doing that? Uh, if you've got a, a field full of fescue, um, you know, fescue is a cool season grass, so you're, you're trying to target it when it's growing the most, and that's gonna be um, either in the spring or the fall. Um, it's during the summertime, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not putting on near as much growth at all, it's going pretty dormant. And um, so you're trying to catch it in the early spring when it's growing. And, and what you wanna do is use um, two quarts of glyphosate, and that's gonna depend you know, on what else is out there, um, what, what, what the field looks like. So, so two quarts of glyphosate just in general, um, usually Ranger Pro, um, Buccaneer, there's plenty of brands out there that's not, you know, not just Roundup, but two quarts of 41% glyphosate per acre, um, four ounces per acre of a Mazapic is normal in the spring. Um, Plateau is very common what we use around here, but there's other options for that as well. Uh, with one quart per acre of methylated seed oil, which is a surfactant, and what it does is help that herbicide stick to the plant, so it doesn't just necessarily run off of the plant very easily. Um, it help it helps that herbicide sink in. And then um, you know it's going to take you know a couple of weeks, depending on you know how how the weather conditions are when you spray. Uh, but anyway, it might take a week, two weeks, a month to you know really kill everything off. And at that point in time, after about a month, what's going to die will be dead at that point. And then when the field's brown, like we mentioned earlier, you can burn off that thatch layer. Um, and if you're spay, uh, spraying fescue in the fall, maybe this is your second treatment. Uh, maybe it's your first treatment, whatever that may be. Um, it's going to be very similar to in the spring, but maybe a few different rates for some things. So, you know, if you've, if you've already sprayed it that first time, or if this is your first treatment, you may want to graze hay or burn it like Kelly mentioned earlier. And what that's gonna do is just get that, get that new growth started back. So you're not spraying um, older, um, taller vegetation. And again, you might use two quarts, um, depending on the situation of glyphosate. 
Um, in, in the fall, you may want to use eight ounces per acre of a Mazda pick. Um, it, it, it calls for a little bit higher rates later in the year in the fall, um, but then you're still going to use one quart per acre of that methylated seed oil surfactant. And again, you want to burn off the residue once everything browns up. So many of our native grasses are tolerant of a Mazapit, which is why it's, it's very good um, for maybe if you have an already established stand of native grasses. Um, maybe some landowners are you know, cattle grazers and have a pasture of, of native grasses. And this can work really well for removing undesirables from your field because big blue stem, little blue stem, Indian grass, side oats, grandma, um, they're all tolerant of a Mazapit. And some others at, at certain rates are also tolerant. At four ounces per acre, you've got eastern gamma grass, switch grass, some of your wild rice. So these are all of the, uh, the native grasses that we commonly recommend for people who are grazing native grasses. So it's a great, a great tool in the toolbox for those guys as well. But we also tank mix it in, as we mentioned earlier, when we're trying to um, eliminate pesky pasture. Many of our native forbs are tolerant of a Mazapic as well. Uh, this is not an exhaustive list of all of them. These are some of the ones that you might find on the label if you read it. Uh, there are others out there that uh, you know, I've researched some and um, a quick Google search can also um, help you find out what some of those are. Though I would, I would look at you know, verified sources, but um, there's many, many of our native plants are, are tolerant of a Mazapic. So what kind of effect does it have on weeds? Um, so many of the ones that we find in, in old fields, like pigweed, ragweed, mare's tail, some of those are not controlled by a pig, but it does control uh, tall fescue, crabgrass, foxtail, panicum, Johnson grass. So and those are you know, more of the undesirables that we want to get rid of. Um, so it, it does its job. It, it's a, it's a good, good tool to have in the toolbox. All right, so um, uh, Wes did a great job of talking about uh, conversion of cool season pasture systems. And I just wanted to do a quick note. We've got a good storm brewing outside. So if we lose a connection, I apologize in advance for that. But we're going to keep going until that happens. Uh, so now we're going to talk about, uh, you know, warm season field systems. You know, Bermuda is a nasty one we have to deal with in Arkansas. Uh, Bermuda is persistent. It's not easy necessarily to get rid of. But again, we want to start with that clean slate that we mentioned, you know, grazing, haying, or burning to, to get that fresh new growth. Hi, folks. Well, it looks like uh, Wes and Kelly might have temporarily lost internet there for a second, but we'll give them a minute to see if they can get back on and get their screen shared again. I think we're back. Let's okay, get this deal. screen. Let's get this screen uh, opened up here. All right. Everyone can see the screen. I hope so. We, uh, we left off talking about spring and summer treatments of Bermuda. And this is a warm season grass. So again, this is when we would be dealing with that. The herbicide we like to use, it's an Amazapir product. Uh, the brand that's worked really well is Arsenal AC. And we need 24 ounces per acre of this herbicide with one quart per acre of methylated seed oil included. And again, like Wes explained, that's methylated seed oils or surfactant that helps the herbicide stick to the foliage. It sticks to the leaves and help it, uh, helps the contact. So again, with Bermuda, we, we've got to hit Bermuda before it goes to seed. If we wait till after, you know, you've got a new crop of Bermuda that's going to pop up next year. And honestly, you're going to have to be spot treating Bermuda, you know, the next year anyway. So we, we need to try and get ahead of this while we can. So Again, 24 ounces of an Amazapir or Arsenal AC, which is an Amazapir product, a quart per acre of methylated seed oil, and you've got to try and get it before it goes to seed. But a note on Arsenal AC, it's uh, many of our native grasses and forbs are actually pretty tolerant of Arsenal. And uh, so that's something that's beneficial if we do have to spot treat Bermuda in the future. 
And uh, just a quick note, you know, we're talking a lot about herbicides and some people have are uncomfortable with that and that's all right. But on, in these larger systems, it, we have to deal with this unnatural state sort of in an unnatural means. You know, these are invasive non-native plants that for 20 acres, 50 acre conversions, we, it's difficult to accomplish that without, you know, good quality herbicides. As long as we're following those recommended rates on the label, we should be just fine. Um, seems that uh, the presentation has paused on us. Well, so I'll just keep talking then. The next type of systems that are warm season are our typical Bahia grass pastures, Dallas grass, all these other introduced warm seasons that we may come into contact with in other pasture settings or even just old field settings that are that have annual and perennial non-native weeds growing in them. And again, graze, hay, burn to get that clean slate. But also um, we can treat this with glyphosate usually. Two quarts per acre is usually enough to deal with these other introduced warm season grasses. Again, with a quart of methylated seed oil per acre, that's that surfactant that's gonna help stick to the uh, leaf foliage and treat as many times as necessary during the, during the growing season. At least two treatments. You know, we, uh, it's very important. We keep talking about site prep and uh, we can't, can't state enough how important the process of site prep is. We've got, uh, I'm dealing with two projects now where we got one treatment on the pasture at the end of the growing season. And now we're having to work backwards dealing with, uh, you know, green up of the grass that we were originally trying to get rid of. You know, and it's just, if we had started earlier in the year, you know, earlier in the growing season, gotten a couple of treatments, we may not have to be dealing with that right now. And, you know, that's just time and money and resources that can be spent elsewhere. And, uh, you know, if you can only get one treatment on a pasture or a field, you know, we have a project that's a great example right now in Hot Spring County where uh, we did a, a round of glyphosate, but we included a, a grass selective herbicide in that. And, you know, to our surprise, it, it knocked it out. It knocked out the Bahia in that one treatment. So not every system is the same, but just to be safe, start early in the growing season and treat it as many times as necessary to make sure we're accomplishing that goal. So once everything is dead, once that residual grass that we need to get rid of to ensure the establishment of our seed mix is done, we're just gonna burn that off. This is the best way to get a clean seed bed to broadcast into. And in the pictures, it's just different. This is a head fire versus backing fires across the same field. We were just kind of having a good time with it, watching different fire effects. But as you can see, that's great. That's 100% seed soil contact is gonna be happening here. Yeah, and one thing I want to mention here, Kelly, you know, is uh, when you do this, this burn, this is, once you've got everything killed off, you know, this is the burn before you plant. And you want to make sure that when you burn all this last batch layer off, that you may not be doing it too early or too far in advance of when you plant. Um, because maybe there is some, still some, some things left in that seed bank that are going to show up after you burn. Um, so you want to try to burn as close to when you're going to plant as possible. So um, you, you know, you give those seedlings the best opportunity to show up before anything else does. Absolutely. So now Wes is going to jump back in and give us an overview of the different types of equipment that we can use here. Yeah, so a lot of you may be familiar with most of this stuff, but we just wanted to throw it in here just in case. Um, so um, on bigger acreages, you might be using a tractor. Um, and, and with those, you, you might be using a, you know, a boom sprayer or a boomless sprayer. Um, and you know there's different types of those you might have one that's mounted on a trailer or uh, with a three-point hitch system like this uh, there's different options um, that work well in different areas so just depending on you know how how rocky your area is or how open it is um, might depend on what tools that you use um, but but if you're if you're working on larger acreages um, a tractor is probably your best route um, and so they make boomless sprayers that they usually have one to two nozzles that 
spray anywhere from, you know, 10 to upwards of, you know, 40, 50 feet at a spray width. So just, you know, depending on what your sites look like might depend on whether you use a boom or a boomless sprayer. And we'll talk a little bit about that here in just a few minutes. Um, on smaller sites with smaller landowners might only need um, a smaller sprayer that might mount to your ATV or UTV. And most of the time these up to about 25, 45 gallons um, on, an, on an ATV and you can get up to you know, 6,500 gallons on a UTV. So just depending on what you know, your resources, the size, uh, whatever it might be. Um, but you can get boom and boomless sprayers for those as well. And these are just some examples here of what you might have in your toolbox. So choosing the right equipment, when would I choose a boom sprayer over a boomless sprayer and vice versa? Um, boom sprayers work uh, better in large open fields. They provide more precise spraying for sensitive areas or if you've got maybe um, two pastures side by side that you are really worried about spraying the herbicide on the, the near nearby pasture, um, these boom sprayers, they're spraying directly straight down onto the ground, usually just a couple of feet off of the ground um, and you have less likelihood of the wind causing that herbicide to drift over just because you don't have as much out in the open air. Uh, boomless players work well in large fields or work really well in small fields, uh, a lot better than a boom sprayer would. Um, they're easy to, easier to maneuver around other obstacles and trees and uh, whatever you might have. So maybe you've got a small, smaller plot in the, in the middle of the woods that you can't really get a boom sprayer out to. These boomless sprayers are great for that. And they can be adjusted in a lot of different ways. So if you were trying to create a feathered edge along the edge of your field, um, you can adjust your, boom, your boomless nozzle to spray kind of up into the trees and remove some of uh, those, those limbs or um, you know, the privet that might be growing, whatever it might be. Um, it's very, very versatile sprayer, so good for small landowners. So to kind of reiterate everything we've talked about, you know, failed seedings a lot of times can be traced back to bad site prep. And, and, you know, again, we gave the one example earlier of how we're just having to backtrack now and deal with the problem that if, if we had taken a little bit more time or maybe if we put it off to the next year and had the time we needed to get, you know, better site prep on it, we wouldn't be dealing with that right now. And that's it's where it all starts to get, to get down the road, to get where we need to be with quality habitat for pollinators and everything else. It starts with site prep. And so make sure that you getting with a biologist, whether it's with us or one of the game and fish biologists in your area to uh, you know, get a plan and get, get some help with that. This is our map of the 12 forever biologists in Arkansas, all our contact information. Like Ryan said at the beginning, this is being recorded. So if you need to come back and copy some of this down, you know, feel free to contact any of us. Uh, we would love to meet with you and look at your properties and see what type of habitat projects we can get going. And uh, lastly, you know, we have webinars the rest of the week. Tomorrow, uh, they're going to talk to you about seed mix design, and I highly recommend tuning into that. Don't think that we can't necessarily do something on your property. You know, seed mixes can be designed all kinds of different ways to fit different scenarios, and I uh, highly recommend tuning in the rest of the week to see what everyone is going to be talking about. And uh, so that's, that's all we had. This is our contact information. Reach out to us with any questions you have. And uh, thanks everyone for tuning in. All right, thank you very much, Kelly and Wes. That was a fantastic presentation. Um, I didn't have any questions that came across during the presentation in chat, but we'll give folks a couple minutes here if they wanna type in a question, if they have any. Um, I could also, um, I think I will, I will, while we're waiting, people, Ryan, go ahead, Wes. So while we're waiting, um, you know, we talked about fescue conversion and Bermuda conversion. I actually talked with Ryan about this here just yesterday. I was looking at a site um, in my area that's uh, mostly fescue. Um, it has some small spots of Bermuda and Johnson grass. So when you're dealing with a site like this, uh, obviously your Bermuda grass and Johnson grass are a little more aggressive and harder to kill than that fescue is. So in a situation like that, um, you really want to start with those more aggressive, tougher to kill grasses first. Because if you don't, um, and you try to kill that fescue first with just with glyphosate, and you don't kill the Johnson grass and Bermuda grass or whatever else it might be out there that's more aggressive, um, then you're giving those harder, 
more aggressive grasses um, the opportunity to show themselves and take over that field. And then you've got a full field of Bermuda and Johnson grass to take care of, whereas before you might have just had some spots. So in that scenario, you would want to, you know, take take the steps to, to kill off that Bermuda and Johnson grass first and then worry about your fescue. Because more than likely what, what you're going to use to kill off those, those cover to kill grasses might kill your fescue and other problem grasses as well. So just kind of start from you know, top down and, and work your way in those type scenarios. Great, great point, Wes, thank you. So there was a question that came through from, from Connie. He said he heard privet. What's the best approach to eliminating privet? So I deal with a lot of Chinese privet down in my area. And you know, it, it depends on the size of your problem. You might have a small problem or you might have a large gigantic privet problem. If you're dealing with privet, you know, that's waist to head high, you know, you can typically use a foliar application of glyphosate, you know, during the summer and take care of that. I actually, I sprayed some in my yard earlier in the spring with uh, Roundup and it, it hasn't re-sprouted yet. So I've been lucky on that. Um, if it's larger, if you've got larger privet thickets, it may be better to go ahead and use a cut stump treatment is what that's called. So actually getting in there and cutting down the hedges and treating the stumps with herbicide. And, uh, and there are different herbicides you use on that. And I, I'm yeah. losing it on the top of my head right now. It kind of just depends on like, I guess the area you're in and how sensitive that area is. Um, yeah. And if you've got you know, nothing around that you're worried about killing, if you don't have a plant of oak trees nearby, you may want to go in and use some arsenal. Um, and, and if, if not, if you've got some trees, something else that you're worried about around it, something you don't have to worry about, you know, being as precise with um, Garline. Um, and there's different different types of Garline. I think Garline 4A is an oil base that is really good for basal applications and foliar sprays. It sticks um, sticks a little bit better. Um, but um, you know, Garline 3A is more water based and maybe a little bit safer. Um, for use at home, so uh, it just it just depends on the area. Yeah, and and he's absolutely right with the the being careful with herbicides using stump treatments. It's very targeted use. Some of these herbicides, like arsenal, if it gets into the soil, you know, it, it could do some damage to surrounding trees. And there are a lot of nightmare stories of things like that happening in the past. So be sure when you're doing a treatment like treating stumps after you cut it down, we're I mean, just treating the stump if at all possible. Try to keep it from running off. Try to keep it from leaking as you're walking around, those type of things. Okay. Um, Logan asked, uh, is orchard grass better than fescue for quail? Or can you recommend something that provides a balance between those, between those of us with cattle, but also wanting to support quail habitat? So lucky for Logan, we have Ryan Diener on the call right now, and he's got a great answer for that. I'm not as familiar yet with balancing the grazing systems or orchard grass. So just uh, if we want to, if we really want to just look at those two cool season grasses, then the answer is yes. Orchard grass is better for quail than fescue um, because like our native grasses, orchard grass also grows as a clump grass and uh, although it can get thicker than some of our warm season grasses it uh, tends to, to stay in that clump form or shape better than fescue does. A young fescue field will be clumpy but very quickly those fescue fields especially when grazed uh, will turn into a carpet of grass and they'll, they'll definitely form a mat on the ground and fill in all the blank space. So if we're really just looking at those two particular grasses yes orchard grass is better um, but only marginally so when compared to the potential for, for native species. Um, in that regard, um, it would be better than fescue for the grazing system, although there's definitely downsides to grazing orchard grass. It's not going to be, you know, as tolerant to heavy grazing and stuff like that, um, but it could be a great forage for at least part of your forage base. I would also highly recommend looking at or having a discussion um, with any of our biologists or any of the grazing specialists here in the state about the potential for, for native grazing, especially if you're in North Arkansas and you have uh, a fair amount of cool season forage, um, adding some native forages to your, your grazing management and your rotation 
uh, could be a very, very good thing. It could really help boost uh, summer forage production, uh, increase the bottom line on the property, uh, allow for more grazing throughout the summer, resting some of those cool seasons so you can extend your fall grazing into winter and uh, should be able to feed fewer bales with a, with a better system and more production through the summer, allowing for that type of stockpiling system. Um, so there are advantages also to trying native forages, which uh, will be substantially better for, for quail um, and still be a very good option uh, for forage and for your cattle production as well. Yeah, just to add to that, Ryan, um, I'm actually working with a landowner right now, but that's his main goal is cattle production. And we, we worked on a seed mix for him and it were just for, for cattle grazing in general, not just for him, but uh, it you know includes uh, big blue stem, little blue stem, Indian grass, um, some cool season wild rice, um, and the multiple other species of grass that those are all, you know, great species for grazing and um, quail nesting. So there's, there's options for everything. Um, and like, like Ryan said, um, the, those, those native, native grasses are, are what, are what we really strive to, to get out there. Um, and they're not, not for all the, all the scenarios that you can't, you know, obviously graze just, just on those native warm season grasses, but it's a really good um, addition to the program you've already got going. Yep, great question. Thank you, Mr. Stone. Um, okay, give it a, another minute or so and let folks type in any other questions they may have. Uh, still no questions have come in over the Facebook live feed, although Suzanne did point out that you guys misspelled Johnson Grass. I caught another misspelling in there too. It doesn't seem like anyone else did. <laughs> That's all good. Um, I actually have it to where uh, I change the settings to where the individuals on the Zoom meeting can actually unmute themselves. So if you do have a question, you can't figure out the chat, uh, feel free to unmute yourself and you can go ahead and just ask us the question too. Okay, well, hearing and, and seeing no more comments or questions, uh, wanted to thank everybody that came on today. Uh, wanted to thank uh, Kelly and Wes for the great presentation. Uh, you still see their contact information there on the screen. Please feel free to reach out to them uh, with any questions that you may have. Uh, you can also go back and look at the, the screen that they showed that shows all of our biologists uh, range across the state. And uh, in particular, uh, for Mr. Logan, who asked the question about grazing, uh, just to let folks know, we will also have a new grasslands wildlife biologist coming on board in the next couple of weeks. Uh, he will start here in the state in early July, and uh, they will also be a resource for folks that want to talk about wildlife friendly grazing practices, uh, both for non-native wildlife friendly grazing things that can be done, as well as potential native grazing. All right. Well, thank you everybody for joining. Again, look for this uh, on our YouTube channel, and this will also be available on our Facebook page since we were live streaming this. Uh, thank you all for joining. Please go check out our events on our Facebook page. We have three more of these webinars happening yet this week to go through the rest of the process from designing and planning a seed mix all the way through how to actually put the seed on the ground. And then finally on Friday, looking at programs that are available to help folks do this type of work. So thank you all for coming and we hope to see you all again in the next few days. Thanks everyone. Appreciate y'all.